looks like the slides are loading, but everything else is good, so we can go ahead and get started. Welcome to day two of um, C3. Welcome to day two of the Critical Decentralization Cluster. That is this place that you were in right here. Um, if you would like to view what we're going to be doing today, as well as workshops and assemblies that are a part of this cluster, you can go to decentral.community. And there we have all of the assemblies that are here. We have um, a schedule where you can see everything that's going to be going on. You can mark your little calendars. For those of you that have you know, little paper calendars, you can kind of put your little check marks. Or does everybody use their phone these days? Everybody uses their phone? Who has a physical calendar that they mark? OK, nobody. You guys are, when they say our generation is lost in technology, you guys are what they're talking about. Uh, we, need to, we need to start coming back. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Um, I am actually going to be the first speaker. So in addition to being the MC of the stage, did I introduce myself already? No? You guys have no clue I am? I could just be some random guy who kind of walked up here and picked up the microphone. It's like, welcome, everybody. No, my name is Diego Salazar. Um, I am a Monero contributor. I am a person with social skills. So they said, hey, Diego, you could go on the stage, right? And I said, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. And what do you know? This is now my new home. I have discovered my passion, my calling. And all right, we're looks like we're ready to go. We're going to jump right into my talk. What? OK. So um, yes, decentral.community. Uh, I just want to wait to make sure that the stream has started. But yes, we are good. All right. So everything is ready to go. I'm supposed to speak for 15 minutes, but that's supposed to start at 1.15, which is in 10 minutes, which means if I start my talk now, I get 25 total minutes. I can extend my talk. That's the cool thing about being the first one of the day. So come one, come all, take a seat. We're going to be talking about funding models of FOSS. We're going to be talking, uh, for those of you who don't know what FOSS is, uh, who here does not know what that acronym stands for? We are at C3. I assume most of you do. Um, so free open source software. It's kind of, this is a difficult conversation to have. This is a sad conversation to have. But this is a necessary conversation to have. How do we fund our free open source software? Um, the big emphasis here is on the free. It is freely given. You know, we don't charge money to download. We don't charge money to use it. We don't charge money to deploy it. So how do, we, how do developers make money off of this? How do people make money off of this? Should they make money off of this? You know, there's this big raging debate that goes on between purists, between people that think that it should be this way, between people that think it should be that way. We're going to kind of explore a few of these and why this is important to talk about, why this is important to have a conversation on. And I'm not here to tell you that I'm right and you're wrong, even though it's probably true. I'm here to tell you guys just you know some of the different ways that people look at these types of things. So we, uh, we are in a world, we live in a world where some people think that you know it should be given away for free, the software should be given away for free, and it is, but people shouldn't be making money off it. That's not what they should, that's not what this whole, whole thing is about. But the end result, okay, the end result of this, regardless of intentions, regardless of ideals, the end result is that we have poor hungry developers sitting at home, growing skinnier every day, not even having the, the strength to open the blinds and go out and meet people. And it's very sad, and they get sadder and sadder every day. They're not, they're not you know, we, uh, it's, it's very telling that society has a view, like, so, you know, just kind of moving away from the jokes for a bit. It's very telling that society has a view of what we would call nerds, you know, or people who, who want to push technology forward as people that kind of huddle over their computers, that don't talk with people. And, you know, there, there may be some truth to some of these things, to some of these stereotypes, but, um, um, a lot of it is really not true, um, but it's really sad because we have a passion. People that build, open source software creators have a passion to build things that are going to better society, but they do so often at cost to themselves. They do so at cost, not just monetary cost to themselves, but at co you know, social cost to themselves. They're not going out and doing different things, uh, vocational cost to themselves. It's because they have a vision about how to make the world a better place. And they know that many times, if they don't step up, that nobody else will. These are very important people to our ecosystem. These are very important people that help make this world go round. 
And they are sacrificing, and, and, and in some ways, you know, you can't do this kind of thing without sacrificing something. But we as a society, in my opinion, uh, we, we want to try to reward people who are going to push society forward. We want to try to reward these people. We don't want them to be sad. We want these people to be fed. We want these people to be fed not just, you know, with, uh, with food, with money. We want, them to, we want these people to be fulfilled. Because we, as we are starting to understand, as new science comes out about how people work well and work better, the, be the people that are able to kind of execute on their ideas, stick with their ideas, not burn out, are people that are fulfilled people in many different areas of life. Um, I'm not going to be covering all of these things. I'm not going to be covering the societal aspects, how we should, you know, help these people um, get dates or anything. Um, I'm going to be mostly covering money uh, because money is where a lot of these things come down to. So uh, there is a fantastic, wonderful um, research paper that was done by Nadia Eggball. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. It's here in the bottom. It's called Roads and Bridges. Roads and Bridges. And if you just type in, you know, your favorite search engine, Roads and Bridges, um, open source, yeah, you're going to find this paper. It's very long, but it's so, so good. And it, it talks about how open source software is becoming the roads and bridges, the, the infrastructure of our society. Similar to the fact that roads, bridges, everything that we used to get around, this infrastructure needs to be maintained. And without them, society kind of stops functioning as we know it. We have a digital infrastructure that is built on open source. We have a digital infrastructure that is built on open source. This is so important because every single proprietary software out there under the hood is probably 80% open source stuff, libraries that they've put in so they didn't have to re-implement from scratch, and 20% their own stuff that they put on top of that and they sell that. So what happens if that open source 80% that they have underneath the hood falls under disrepair, is no longer maintained? A lot of things really start to fall apart. Not just the open source software, but the proprietary things that we use. So we tend to think that oh, the open source stuff, you know, it's the stuff that you know, it breaks anyway. Um, it's the kind of stuff that you install it, maybe it's gonna work, maybe it's not. Maybe it's gonna help your needs, maybe it's not. Uh, but really, this stuff, um, underneath a lot of these things that we do use on an everyday basis, um, and you know, speaking to a different kind of audience, maybe uh, we don't use some of these more proprietary things like Discord, like Slack, like whatever. Hopefully, we're using the open source self-hosted alternatives. But in the event that we're not, these things really do depend on a lot of these roads and bridges, this, in this infrastructure that is being maintained by open source people, oftentimes for free. Okay, so this is kind of what I'm really going to start delving into. Uh, there was another paper, no, it was, it was an article, it wasn't a paper, it was an article that I read, um, Sustainability versus Profit. And it talked about how we keep, we, the, the conversation is always, how do we make open source sustainable? How do we make it sustainable? And this, this author thought that this was the incorrect question to ask. Because when the businesses, the businesses that are making money off of open source software by deploying it underneath the hood and then putting their own stuff on top of it, uh, they're, they're not worried about their sustainability. They're worried about their profit. So like how do we, they're asking, how do we make, how do we ensure that this developer keeps maintaining this thing? How do we sustain him as opposed to how do we pay him what he's worth? How do we make sure this person is living a fulfilled life? How do we make sure this person feels like their talents are not being wasted? Because at some point, passion can only take you so far where the person's like, you know, I, I'm working below market cost. I'm working many times for free. Um, I, I got to do something where I'm paid what I'm worth. The, 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 the really sad truth about open source, and this is the, the little pernicious, insidious thing that nobody likes to talk about, is that so much of open source software is maintained out of guilt. Open source, the currency of it, is guilt. Where somebody says, I can't stop maintaining this. I can't stop. Like, too many people are depending on me. Maybe now I'm already a mid-sized library. You know, I'm not, I'm not so small anymore. There's so many people that tell me, oh, thank you so much for making this. I used it in my thing, and it's doing fantastic. And you, you solve the bugs. You solve the problems. You know, you, you work on the, the code, and nobody's paying you for it. But there's too many people depending on you for you to stop. You feel guilty. You can't stop this. And this happens way more than we think. 
And it's really, really sad. So these people, first of all, we're already not in a sustainable place, but I think, I agree with the author um, that sustainability is not even what we're after. We want these people to not just feel sustained in their ability to make open source. We want these people to be profitable. We want these people um, to go ahead and do the thing that they are passionate about that makes the world a better place, maintaining these roads and bridges, and live a good life, not just a, a, a sustained life, an average life. Does, that, does all this make sense, this whole sustainability versus profit thing? I think it's time for businesses to step up, and we're going to kind of get into this a little bit later. I think it's time for businesses to step up and really, we got to start like, you know, and adopt a highway project, but you got to adopt a FOSS. You know, you adopt a FOSS. Like, hey, uh, if you, if you, a uh, portion of Slack money, Discord money, whatever, goes to support uh, open source software. And that, that does kind of happen, and we're going to go into that. But um, now we're going to kind of talk about the heart of this matter. And that's the reality that some people think that we shouldn't be trying. I'm not, the word is not to monetize, but we should not try to help developers do this for profit. Not even sustainability. Maybe sustainability is, is a little bit different. Because, and th this is an argument that I somewhat agree with, because only so much of the motivation can be for money before we start to lose some of that passion, before we start to lose some of that ideals, before maybe things start to sway, the vision starts to shift from the original because now we are catering to this business or to this audience that we know is going to pay us versus the people, maybe the marginalized or maybe the people who don't have the money that also need our software, but now their needs are no longer being uh, considered when we're deciding which direction to take uh, the software project. And there is there's some nuggets of truth to this, right? Some of the best stuff comes out when somebody's like, I, I, I am not content with what is currently out there, so I'm going to make my own. Or when somebody identifies a need in people and really out of a compassionate heart, out of a humble place of wanting to help the world, make the world a better place, they start working on these kinds of things. And if somebody jumps into open source because it's profitable, because it's, it's a potential for them to make money, that skews things a little bit. Now all of a sudden they're going to go where the latest trends are and usually marginalized people groups or people who have a real need but they can't pay for it are not trendy. Lately, um, you know, it, as society has, has moved forward, lately it's becoming more of a trend to, uh, to so you can kind of say in your marketing materials, oh, these are the people that we're helping and, and look at how we're helping this marginalized group. And that's all good and fine, but if that's kind of a marketing thing or if that's always a side thing as opposed to the heart of the project, um, you're never going to be quite as pure ideologically or something like that. So this is, this is definitely something to consider when we're talking about, you know, how do we make FOSS sustainable or how do we make FOSS profitable? It's, it, is this something we want to do to begin with? Um, because maybe the, the percentage of people that will do it for profit will shift um, in a direction that we don't want it to shift. So currently, how do we fund? Um, I love open source software. I love just finding new things all the time. New, uh, self, I, I'm not a very good system administrator. <laughs> I would, I would uh, rate myself maybe a 4 out of 10. But I love to find new deployable open source software and put it on my own little servers and, and mess it up four times and then finally get it correct the fifth time and now it works and it's really cool. And I take it offline because I know I could probably be pretty easily hacked because <laughs> I'm not a good systems administrator. But it's so fun for me. It's so fun for me to find all these things. They're like, oh, we're going to help you with your accounting or we're going to help you with, um, you know, you can go ahead and host your own pictures or you can uh, have your own blog. That's not on Medium because they keep saying, hey, this is the 12th article you read this month. Do you want to sign up? I'm pretty sure that you do. And you say, no, leave me alone. And you don't have to deal with that with the, with the Federated Universe and stuff. And the Federated Universe is so, super cool. It's super awesome. And as I've looked through each of these um, open source softwares, I don't just see, okay, how do I download? What's very intriguing to me is how are you guys um, sustaining yourselves? How are you guys making any sort of money? How can you afford to do this? Especially some of these bigger projects. So I like to look through their, um, I, I click around try to, uh, their websites to try to find out how they do that. So let's go, ahead, go over some of the things that currently exist. Um, so I, I've separated these into two categories. Uh, personal options, and this oftentimes takes place with a smaller team or, whether, or if the person is a team of one. The person tries to fund themselves. They don't try to monetize the software in any way. They try to find um, ways for them to survive. Uh, so the, we have the personal options and then kind of the monetization options where they look to monetize the software itself while still trying to keep a spirit of open source. So uh, one of the ways that we do this is we don't do this. 
And this happens quite often where um, we already talked about guilt, but maybe there's a, an element of altruism in there where they're like, you know, I want to help the world. I want to do it. Nobody, nobody else can do this, uh, this thing that I'm doing. Uh, nobody has this idea or nobody's willing to execute on it. So I'm going to do this. And that's fantastic. You know, if you're doing this out of altruism, and th there are some times where, you know, you'll have some richer people or, or some people with great ability that are able to implement everything, the full stack of everything, they will do this because they want to make a difference. And if that's you, I'm not trying to push you in one way or the other saying, hey, you should try to monetize this or you should try to be profitable. If you're doing this for you, more power to you, by all means. Uh, we, we need to celebrate these people. We also need to understand that not everybody is in that position, whether it's financially or otherwise, right? Um, and so I think uh, too often, FOSS people butt heads over this kind of thing. And it's kind of sad because it, it fragments the community. If you are in a position where you can do this kind of thing, that's fantastic. Uh, let's not take it out on the people that aren't in this, in this position. They, they want to work on open source too, but they might need to do some other things to do that. So altruism, you go girl, make it happen. Um, guilt, we already talked about this. So much of this, so much of FOSS is maintained out of guilt. Uh, they are not monetizing themselves in any way. They're just like, I, ha I have to do this. Too many people are depending on me. Passion, it's similar to altruism, but maybe it's just something you're really into, you know? You're not trying to help the world, but it's just super interesting to you. So as you keep working on it, as you keep tapping away at your keys, uh, you find that, you know, this is just what helps make you feel alive. This is your hobby. Some people have Game of Thrones, which, you know, uh, nobody has Game of Thrones anymore. <laughs> and some people have working on open source software. Uh, this actually happened, I discovered this, so I put it on the slide. Um, some people, in an effort to keep working on open source software, they will move to a cheaper place. So they will move from the first world to someplace like Southeast Asia where, or someplace like South America where uh, living expenses are much, much lower so they can keep not charging for their software and not, charging, uh, not making money themselves or making very little money off odd jobs and afford to um, keep afford to live and to eat, you know, the cat with the fish. I think this is really, really sad and really funny at the same time. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't want that to have to be the go-to for all open source software developers. Um, the, the other way that we do this, you know, uh, funding personally, or not trying to monetize your product. Uh, some, some of these are, are, can, can be quite interesting. They say, okay, so I, I developed this open source software solution for um, handling support tickets. Uh, there's a really cool one called OS Ticket. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's an open source software for handling support tickets. It's kind of neat. Um, one of the things these people might choose to do is if you want this integrated into your guys' thing, um, your business, whatever the case may be, you could contact us. We can make a custom version for you depending on your needs. Obviously, we, the developers, know the software better than anybody else. So we would know what to tweak and how and how long it would take. We'd be able to give you a very accurate assessment of this. Um, so we can make a custom version for your needs, and that is going to cost money. Um, otherwise, they might be a freelancer. They say, hey, look, this is my portfolio. This open source software projects that I make prove my competence. Um, so I can be a freelancer for you in this area or another area, and if you doubt me, you can, you can look at this. And uh, what this does, on a lot of open source software developers lament the fact that this, while it's exciting and it, it, there's some cool projects that they can work on, it splits their time between freelancing and working on this open source software that they actually want to work on. Because the more jobs that they get, the more money they get, yay, but that's also the fewer hours that they have to work on the open source software project that they want to work on. Uh, the last one is get hired. Um, this very, very rarely happens, but uh, it has sometimes been the case where large enterprises deem an open source software project or library critical enough to their infrastructure that they hire the open source software developer to exclusively work on that. So it is an option. Um, I do believe, and I could be incorrect on this, but I do believe, like as an example, Dropbox has hired the Python developer to work on it full time. That is really awesome, and I wish we'd see more of this, but it is also very, very rare. Um, so if you are an open source software developer and you're trying to think, okay, I don't want to monetize the software, but what are some other alternative ways for me to do this? Contact Dropbox. They're the ones that will get you hired. Um, that's not true. Uh, they're uh, they're going to be mad at me for saying that. Okay, now we're going to move along from uh, you know marketing yourself 
to marketing your product. You're, you have this open source software thing, this offering, and you want it to still be open source, but you somehow want to monetize it. There are some really interesting ideas that some people have had in order to do this. Pay for support. Um, this is one of the most, inter uh, one of the most common. Uh, things like Ubuntu have done this where it's free for you to deploy, it's free for you to download, it's free for you to use, but uh, if, you want, you know, if you want customized support that is beyond searching Stack Exchange and forums and you know, every time you go through the forums, the, the post for the thing that you want is from 2007 and it no longer applies, but it's the only one. And, and so you try it and it doesn't work and those commands don't even exist anymore. What do you do? Um, <clears throat> you can pay for support. So uh, there are some people that have become profitable off of this, but those are usually larger open source software projects because they have enough of a user base. Um, for every user base that you have, no, that's a weird way of putting it because you have one user base. For however many people you have in your user base, only a fraction of those are going to be willing to pay for support. So if you have a small user base, a fraction of a small amount is a very small amount. So you're not going to be able to be profitable off of that. So it's typically with the bigger ones, they're going to be able to do something like this. Um, I put custom for enterprise again. I think that was a mistake on my part. I, I made these slides very early this morning, but I think they're the prettiest ones here. So that's uh, that's what I'm gonna, uh, that's what that bullet put bullet point should say that they're the prettiest slides here. Um, pay to host is that, okay, you know, the, here's our software. You can deploy it yourself. You can host it yourself. If you don't want to mess with that, if you're not a good systems administrator, if, if this looks intriguing to you and you want it, we can host it on our servers or we can deploy it on your servers, but it's going to cost money for that to happen. And um, there are several open source softwares that do this, things like Mattermost, which is a... Um, self-hosted Slack alternative. They, they have custom uh, tiers to allow you to use their servers instead of hosting it on your own for people that don't want that. And as a person that is not a great systems administrator, this might be a great thing for me because I might want to support open source software, I might want to use open source software, but I might not be able to deploy it myself. Um, so I may be able to do something like that. Open core. This is the idea that the core of the software is free and open source, but some premium features, some plugins, whatever the case may be, are not. So things like GitLab are similar to this. You can deploy GitLab yourself. You can use it, do whatever you want with it. But um, you're going to get to a point where if you want specific functionality, it's not going to work that way. You're going to have to pay for that, uh, and they have several tiers of options, uh, or you know you can down you can pay per plugin for some of the other ones. Sponsorship, where you get uh, some big organizations or businesses or whatever to like the work that you do and pay you money to keep going. Okay, so we are starting to run out of time here. I thought I had a little bit more time than that, but that's okay. Uh, the one thing I didn't cover, which is very, very common for almost every open source project, is donations. Please donate, please. We're begging you. We want to keep doing this. Please donate money to us. Here is our PayPal address. More and more, we're starting to see, you know, here's my Bitcoin address, which is, you know, cryptocurrency is one of the cool things about this. It doesn't matter uh, what country you're in, where you are, uh, you should, you'll be able to donate with cryptocurrency. I just wish more of them um, accepted Monero, because if I send Bitcoin, then that ties that to me, and I don't want to be associated with open source at all in my everyday life, because that makes me a nerd. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, this is a very exciting time for cryptocurrencies to use in donations. But if you ask all of these open source developers, uh, how many donations do you get? The answer is not many. So this is not usually a sustainable way uh, to do things. There's new and exciting ways that are starting to pop up. These are relatively recent. Uh, things like recurring crowdfunding. So similar to Patreon, um, which also some open source developers use, we have something new like the Open Collective, which is an open source version of Patreon, um, which allows kind of, you know, you can see what they spend their money on and their receipts and stuff. So this is kind of interesting. Um, and several projects like Cubes and Open Collective itself, um, which is kind of circular, use this to fund themselves. Monero CCS, the community crowdfunding system, Monero didn't have an ICO or a pre-mine or anything, so it relies on donations. And so people can put out ideas and proposals, and if the community likes it, they can fund them. Uh, blockchains, this is kind of new, where this whole ICO craze has happened, and people are like, hey, we want to make this new, fun, cool uh, blockchain project that's going to be open source. Uh, we pre-mined a lot of coins, so we're selling them to you so we can go ahead and do that. This is a new way uh, that did not exist before blockchains. 
Merchandise, uh, this is also quite new and not many people have the ability logistically um, to do this themselves. I started a project, I know C3 is not very uh, commercial so I'm gonna keep the shells to a minimum. Started a project called Cypher Market where uh, you could go on there and I'm trying to partner with more and more open source pro software projects and uh, I, we des I'm a designer so we design the merch, we make the merch, we ship the merch for them and we, we share the profits with them. Um, so ultimately, we're trying to get to a place where FOSS is sustainable, profitable, whatever your personal opinions on this whole divide is. We w I think we all can agree that we want FOSS to continue forward. And the only way that we can do that is via sustainability, profitability. So these, these are some options. These are, this is not an all-inclusive list of how to do this, um, of what options are available to you. These are just the most common ones that I have encountered. Um, by all means, come talk to me after and tell me, oh, this, this is a really neat way that I saw somebody fund this, and I'd be thrilled to, to look at that, because this is something that's deep on my heart. I want, definitely want to find a way, as a person that is not a developer myself, one of the ways that I want to help FOSS is by making sure it sticks around. Um, it's so important for our society, this, this infrastructure that is built beneath us that many of us don't even realize. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope this was slightly informative and uh, I'll be available for questions afterwards off the stage.